So that wraps up our discussion of insulation, which is one of the three major factors controlling climate. The next major factor is albedo. So whereas insulation pertains to the level of solar energy entering the system of the Earth, albedo pertains to how much of that solar energy exits by reflecting back out into space. Albedo is defined as the level of reflectivity of a surface. So the higher the albedo, the more energy is reflected. And albedo varies based on the characteristics of a surface. So for example, dark soil reflects very little solar energy and instead absorbs a lot of it. Whereas lighter colored surfaces, especially ice and snow, reflect lots of energy and absorb very little. This is kind of like the difference between having a car that it has black paint in Arizona versus one that has white paint. The black paint absorbs more energy, the white reflects more of it, and that has a, a, an impact on how hot or cool your car stays. Um, so the illustration on the right is representing this, the fact that solar energy comes into the earth, it hits different surfaces, and then depending on the reflectivity of that surface, depending on the albedo, some amount will be bounced back and then it will escape back out into space. And then obviously if that energy is being reflected back out into space, it's not being used to heat the earth. And albedo is measured, there's, a, there's actual scale that's used to measure it. It ranges from zero to one, where zero represents a surface that absorbs 100% of the solar energy and reflects none of it. And then on the opposite end of the scale, one is a surface that absorbs no light and reflects all of it. So every material can be characterized with a decimal number that is somewhere between zero and one on that scale. And um, you can see some common surfaces represented in this table. So asphalt at the top, which is very dark, is 0 0.04. Coniferous forest, which is like a pine tree forest, a little, little further down in the table, you can see ranges from 0.08 to 0.15. Bare soil is 0.17. Grass is 0.25. Sand is 0.40. Fresh snow is 0.8. And so um, you can see how the reflectivity sort of ranges in a way that probably agrees with our intuitive sense of what colors absorb more energy versus reflect it. And so naturally, if these different surfaces on the earth are reflecting different amounts of sunlight, different parts of the earth that have these different surfaces reflect different amounts of sunlight based on the terrain that you find there, um, whether it's sandy desert or dense forest or polar sheet ice. Different parts of the Earth have a different albedo and different capacity to bounce sunlight energy back out into space. And the albedo of different parts of the Earth also changes over the seasons as well. So here we can see a time lapse of satellite imagery of the Earth over the course of the year and how the terrain changes with the seasons. So during the winter, there's a whole lot more snow and ice than during the summer. Um, and these, these materials, Snow and ice are some of the most reflective natural surfaces that have the highest albedo. So albedo changes over the course of the year. And of course, most of the Earth's surface isn't covered in terrain at all, but rather ocean. And ocean has an albedo capacity as well. But when it comes to bodies of water, the albedo varies significantly based on the angle of the sun. So the more direct the sun's angle, the more energy is absorbed by the water and the less it's reflected. And the graph here shows the relationship between reflectivity or albedo on the vertical y-axis and then the angle of the sun on the horizontal x-axis. And as you can see, if the angle of the sun is zero on the left-hand side, almost no energy is reflected. It's all absorbed. So if the sun is straight up and down, lots of the solar energy is being absorbed by the water. But if we follow these lines to the right, as we get to increasingly dramatic angles of the sun, more and more of the energy ends up being reflected, reflectivity increases, um, rather than the energy being absorbed. So this means that the oceans at polar latitudes absorb much less sunlight energy because the sunlight energy strikes those polar regions at more of an angle compared to the equatorial regions. Another thing to draw your attention to is the fact that the two states of water that you see in this table 
um, liquid water in the form of open ocean and solid water in the form of ocean ice, they have very different albedo levels. So in its solid form of ice, water has a much higher reflectivity than in its liquid form. So ice actually pushes more energy out of the Earth's system by reflecting it compared to liquid water. And this is significant because it embodies a phenomenon that we call a positive feedback loop. A positive feedback loop is a cycle that occurs in nature where the results of an occurrence amplifies the original cause of that occurrence. So in the case of water, ice, and the albedo effect, the positive feedback loop goes like this. When the Earth's climate becomes cooler, the lower temperatures cause more snow and sea ice to be produced. And consequently, the Earth has a higher average albedo because more of the surface of the Earth is ice instead of water. And therefore, more solar energy gets reflected back out into space. And because of this, more energy is lost from the Earth's system and the climate gets even cooler and the cycle continues. So this is known as a positive feedback loop. Um, and this is thought to have been the driving factor in a historical geological state of the Earth known as the Snowball Earth. The Snowball Earth hypothesis pr proposes that during at least one geologic period in the Earth's history, the surface of the Earth was virtually entirely covered in snow and ice. The most likely period when this occurred was 650 million years ago, um, because the geological record during this period shows evidence of there being glaciers at the equatorial regions of the Earth. And the emergence of the snowball Earth would have been brought about by a runaway positive feedback loop of a cooler climate leading to a higher albedo, leading to a cooler climate, leading to a higher albedo, and so on until the whole Earth was ice and snow. And obviously today, the whole Earth is not ice and snow, thankfully. So how did the planet break out of this runaway positive feedback loop? Well, the leading thought is that volcanic activity emitted large amounts of carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere, as did the metabolism of microscopic organisms, because this period in Earth's history was before multicellular life had evolved. And these higher levels of carbon dioxide and methane caused the climate on Earth to warm. Uh, why would CO2 and methane cause the climate to warm? We'll talk about that in just a moment when we get to the greenhouse effect. But the impact of a warming climate would be that the snow and sea ice would start to melt, which would then lower the albedo of the Earth because there would be more open ocean and less ice. And this means less solar energy would be reflected back out into space and instead remain part of the Earth system. And then this would cause further warming of the climate, which would melt even more snow and sea ice and so on. So the positive feedback loop works in the warming direction as well as in the cooling direction. And in fact, getting into a runaway positive feedback loop in the warming direction is one thing that climatologists are very worried about when it comes to the current trends in the warming of the planet that we are seeing right now. But we'll talk more about that later. So on the topic of albedo, there's just one more detail we need to mention. We've been talking about the albedo of solid surfaces on Earth but clouds actually play a role in the Earth's albedo as well. Clouds have a relatively high albedo that rivals the reflectivity of sea ice. So across the globe, clouds actually reflect about 25% of the incoming sunlight before it even hits the surface of the Earth. And this, of course, varies depending upon um, characteristics of the cloud, including the cloud type, the thickness of the cloud, and the angle of the sunlight. For example, cirrus clouds, which are made of ice crystals, have a higher albedo than cumulus clouds, which are made of water droplets. So we've talked about insulation, and we've talked about albedo. There's one more major factor that controls climate. And we can see the importance of this third and final factor if we look at a comparison between the Earth and the Moon. So when we were comparing Earth and Mars, we saw that the average temperature on Earth is about 15 degrees Celsius. The average temperature on the moon is negative 23 degrees Celsius. And given that the Earth and the moon are so close together, on an astronomical scale at least, they both get about the same amount of insulation from the sun. So you might suspect that the reason why the Earth has a higher temperature than the moon is because it has a lower albedo. 
So maybe the moon is reflecting away more of that sunlight energy than the earth is. So that's why it has a lower temperature. However, that is not the case. The earth actually has a higher albedo than the moon. Um, these are the albedo values of the earth and the moon, respectively. They're getting about the same amount of insulation, and the earth is reflecting away more of that insulation, but the earth still has a higher average temperature compared to the moon. So clearly, it's not just all about insulation and albedo. There has to be something else going on here. And that something else is the gases in the Earth's atmosphere. The Earth's atmosphere contains gases that trap and absorb solar energy. Conversely, the moon lacks an atmosphere, so it lacks the ability to trap energy via this mechanism. The mechanism itself is called the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is a phenomenon where heat that is given off by the Earth is trapped by specific gases with heat absorbing capacity in the atmosphere. And we look at this phenomenon briefly in a previous chapter. Insulation from the sun comes in, it warms the planet, and then some of that heat radiates out. And while a portion of it will escape into space, another portion of it will be absorbed by atmospheric gases and trapped, which causes the Earth to heat up uh, in more or less the same way, the same mechanism that takes place in a greenhouse that is used to grow plants, which is why this is called the greenhouse effect. So how greenhouse gases perform this quote-unquote trapping function um, is one question that might occur to you. Because why is it that the greenhouse gases trap the heat energy that's on its way out rather than the sunlight energy that's on its way in? Why do they only absorb the outgoing heat and not the incoming solar radiation? To answer this question, we need to briefly learn something about the energy spectrum. So all light and energy travels in the form of waves. And you can see a wave illustrated at the top of this figure. The wavelength of the energy, um, meaning how frequently the wave goes up and down, is what determines how energy, how much energy is contained within that wave. So a wave that has a more erratic, more frequent up and down pattern, like the one that you see on the left, has more energy compared to a wave that has a more gentle, infrequent up and down pattern like what you see on the right. And we classify energy into different types based on the wavelength and how much energy it has. So different types of energy that you see on the spectrum include gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet light, visible light, um, which is the only type that we can actually see. All of these other types of energy are invisible to us. And then there's infrared and radio waves. And the reason why greenhouse gases have a heat trapping effect is because they can absorb certain wavelengths of light, but not others. This figure here shows you two things. It shows downgoing solar radiation um, on the left side, meaning energy coming into the Earth system from the sun and where that energy lies on the energy spectrum in that yellowish bar at the bottom. So as you can see, the downgoing solar radiation mostly corresponds with the visible light region of the spectrum. It also contains some UV and some infrared as well. The total area under the red curved line shows the total amount of downgoing solar radiation. And the area that is filled in with dark red shows the amount of energy that successfully transmits, meaning it passes through the atmosphere on its way down to the Earth's surface. And as you can see, the curve on the left is almost entirely filled in with red. And so this is showing us that most of the energy received by the sun, by the Earth, successfully transmits down through the atmosphere. It does not get absorbed by the atmospheric gases. And as you can see, the part that's not filled in with red, um, sort of on the left-hand side of that curve, that's mostly in the UV spectrum. And we previously talked about the role that ozone plays in absorbing this type of energy up in the stratosphere. The reason why so much of the downgoing solar energy passes right through the atmosphere is that greenhouse gases cannot absorb it. But greenhouse gases can absorb infrared radiation. So if we turn our attention to the right side of this graph and the part that is made up of the blue curve, when the Earth emits thermal energy, 
heat energy, which is essentially the leftovers of the solar radiation that it absorbed um, in the UV invisible parts of the spectrum, that thermal energy is slightly less energetic. It's found in the infrared spectrum. So the upgoing thermal radiation, the stuff that's emitted out of the Earth's system, is infrared. And again, in this figure, the area under the blue curve line shows the total amount of infrared that is emitted. And the area that's shaded in blue shows how much actually, again, transmits through the atmosphere, successfully makes it out into space. And as you can see, uh, unlike the downgoing solar radiation, in this case, a majority of the energy gets absorbed and only a minority, the part that's shaded in blue, gets transmitted and makes it out. And that's because greenhouse gases absorb that infrared energy. If we want to get more detailed on which greenhouse gases are absorbing which wavelengths of energy, here's a figure that shows just that. So the bottom part of the figure shows a list of major greenhouse gases, and then the gray peaks on the graph show their capacity to absorb energy. And as you can see, with the exception of water vapor, um, water vapor absorbs energy across a wider range of the spectrum. These gases are mostly capable of absorbing energy in the infrared wavelengths. So their little gray peaks occur in the infrared section of the spectrum. You can also see the area on the left side of these spectra where they have virtual, virtually no capacity to absorb the wavelengths that are coming into the planet via solar radiation. So that's the part that I've boxed off in the, um, the yellow square there almost no absorption of the incoming solar radiation by these greenhouse gases, lots of absorption of the infrared outgoing thermal radiation on the right-hand side of the spectrum. So this is the essence of the greenhouse gases heat trapping effect. And of course, not all gases in the atmosphere have this heat absorbing capacity. The four major naturally occurring gases in the Earth's atmosphere that are considered greenhouse gases are water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane and ozone. And these gases are important to the functioning of the Earth's systems. Greenhouse gases are not bad. Having some amount of them is good and important. Um, to give you a sense of this, our current global average te temperature is 15 degrees Celsius, which is about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. But without greenhouse gases and their heat trapping capacity, it would be much, much colder. Negative 18 degrees Celsius or zero degrees Fahrenheit on average across the Earth. And while there's never been a point where the Earth's atmosphere had zero greenhouse gases, like in this example, levels of these gases in the Earth's atmosphere have changed over time. And along with insulation and albedo, these greenhouse gas dynamics have also been a factor that mediates major changes in the Earth's climate over its geological history, which we'll talk about in a future section. A final thing to note before we close out this section is that although these four gases are naturally occurring, human activity is feeding into the production of these gases, especially carbon dioxide and methane. And humans are also generally generating other non-naturally occurring greenhouse gases, which is leading to an enhanced greenhouse effect and higher average temperatures across the globe. And we'll talk more about those patterns as well later in this chapter.